Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy, back again, another week of podcasting. I am recording this intro from my hotel room at the Hyatt in Sydney, overlooking Sydney, well, not Sydney Harbour, it's Cockle Bay Wharf. Well, it's probably part of Sydney Harbour, isn't it? I don't know. Anyway, this is really interesting information. This week's guest, because I've got some drinking to do, I've got to move this along, is Mark Fitzsimmons. Now, Mark, I've known for years and years and years. Mark has been a staple in the metal scene in Canberra and Sydney and Goulburn and everywhere in between, probably, well, those three places anyway. There's not much between those places. But <laughs> Mark's at most metal shows um, around the place and uh, Mark's always there with a the beer in his hand, with his denim vest, with all his patches. He is one of the most passionate, loyal, dedicated music fans out there and is one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life, which is a big call because I've met lots of nice people, but he is definitely, I should say one of the nicest because I'm going to offend somebody. I know it. So Mark is not only a well-known metal fan in the uh, Sydney and Canberra and Goulburn metal scenes, but he is also a chef, a professional chef, not just a chef in the kitchen, in the home kitchen, but a professional chef in a professional establishment. Do you like my explanation? I'm really, really good at this. Uh, he's the executive chef at the Australian Institute of Sport. Mark travels around the world, um, assisting some of our sporting elite with making sure that they stay uh, nourished and have the best nutrition possible. He also goes around and uh, inspects and looks at some of the uh, establishments around the Australian marketplace. Yeah, that sounds good enough. <laughs> As always, I explain my guests really, really well. So enough of me yapping. Let's get straight into it. I had this chat with Mark outside the front of a pub in Canberra, and we explained that. But it's about four or five degrees. It's very, very cold. For whatever reason, we thought it'd be a great idea to, to sit outside. It was noisy inside. But we had our beers, and we figured the beers would numb numb the nerves and they did for a while but uh, the cold definitely got the better of us later on into the chat so we had to have a quick break in between but um, the beers were flowing and there was great chat and I got to learn a hell of a lot more about Mark and what he's been doing over all of these years and um, a lot of a lot of surprises for me personally so this is a really really fun chat and I hope you guys enjoy it as well Where are we, Mark? We're at the Civic Pub, which has a bit of history in Canberra sort of thing. It's the late night haunt after gigs. Yep, yep. Yep. So, so, oh, so this would, this would be the after party. This, this has been in the has past. Been, has, has been. Has been in the, the past. past. It's sort of, Civic sort of died off a little bit. Um, there is a pub just down the road there. Um, they still do gigs. There was the Magpies Club around the corner here. Yeah. But it no longer does gigs. Um, Basement's pretty much it these days. Yeah. ANU shut down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? ANU had its last gigs two, three weeks ago. Really? Mm. Any reason? Do you know? Or? Um, ANU in itself is getting a lot of revamp going on. I know okay. they're doing the kitchen, they're doing the dormitory, so I'm expecting they're just part just, of the part just of the revamp. revamp. Everything. Yep. Shut it down until they've worked out what they're going to do. That's right. Yeah. So you're a local and you've been a local for quite some time eight years now eight years yep. but born and bred in Goulburn I'm in Goulburn mate I was a Goulburn boy <laughs> um grew up reading hot metal mags did you come out of prison <laughs> no I didn't come out of prison mate came out of the psychiatric hospital there my oh, mom, both my parents work at Kenmore the, oh really yeah it's now wow. it's now part of haunted one of those haunted tours oh. but Kenmore hospital was one of the ancient you know Electric shock therapy, water therapy. Really? Yeah, mum was a nurse there in the 70s. And Wow, mm. far out. Okay, your mum's the next guest on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> She's now up in Coffs Harbour running mental health up there. So, really? Yeah. Wow. Okay, far out. So, all right. I know it's quite cold in mm -hmm. Canberra. Goulburn gets pretty freaking cold. Goulburn gets very, very cold, mate. Would it get colder than Canberra? I think it's on oh, par. It's, it's on par. It's yeah, on par. Yeah. Um, yeah. Growing up, we had school closures due to over 45 degree heat. And we had school closures due to snow. Snow? snow. Oh, snow in Goulburn. Yeah, no, not all, not every winter, but we. I remember two winters at least growing up where it snowed. Wow. Teachers bringing skis to school and skiing down the slope, down to the oval, and <laughs> I can I can't even envision that at all. I mean, I know it gets freaking cold, but I never never envisioned. I mean, yeah. maybe frost, but um, um, yeah. You know, wow. I don't know if you've heard of Crookwall. It's not that far. Uh, I heard from, of. Yeah. Yeah. I used to play hockey, and playing hockey in the snow was a regular occurrence in Crookwall. Wow. Yep. So so you got thick skin. 
I don't mind it. I don't <laughs> mind it. I sort of I think I can tolerate it pretty well. I like I like the cold weather in the sense that at least you can put layers on. You can on. do something about it. Yeah. When, when it gets hot, there's only so much you can take off before you get arrested. That's exactly right, <laughs> mate. That's exactly right. Sweating in in your scrungies with no sheet on at night, there's not much else you can do. <laughs> and and that's I guess that's a problem with Goulburn and, and Canberra is that you got those extremes, like both ends. It's like it's really freaking hot. Yep. But it also gets really freaking cold as well. That's oh, that's exactly right, mate. You've got two wardrobes. Basically, every household <laughs> has two wardrobes. Your summer and your winter. And there's, there's, you probably get two months of a nice intermediate mid-range, and that's about it. Wow. So, so you've been in Goldman up until eight years ago, or have you been no, in no, other no. a bit? No, no. Well, you knew me in Sydney. Yeah. I was in Sydney. So, okay, grew up in Goldman. Uh, left Goulburn at about 19. Yep. Moved to Sydney, lived in New... Up the big smoke. Yeah, lived in Chatswood for a little bit, then moved to Newtown. And I was in Newtown for about 18 years. Wow. Yeah. I didn't even realise that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I met... I mean, I just see... I see you around all the time. No. I just assume, ah, Mark's in town. No, I'm one of the first people... So I moved to Sydney at 19 when I was 20. One of the first people I met was Mr. Dave Balfour. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Dave. So You'll be on here soon. So that's... 25 plus years ago wow. when I met Dave and he started taking me around the place um, I remember we would be Thursday nights at the Cobra Club at Parramatta <laughs> um, we would go to Manly Vale on Friday nights yep. and then it would be hit the cross and go to Springfield or go to the Cardoma Tom Tom Club on a Saturday night just had it worked out just travel yeah, you know, we travelled for gigs you know, wow. and, and Dave showed me about and sort of introduced me to Sydney and I mean, growing up in Goulburn, I knew of these bands, and I occasionally came down to the Seven Hills Tavern to yep. see Mortal Sin play. Yeah, back in the late '80s, sort of thing. Yeah, but um, I knew no one in Sydney when I moved here, and he was wow. a, he was a good fella to meet up with. He is. Uh, I honestly think, and I'll have to pick his brain one day to track. But he's he's a bit of a humble guy. I wonder how many people he's actually introduced and and welcomed into Sydney because that guy, the same for me. Like I came came to Sydney in 06, early 06, and he was one of the first guys that would take you under his wing and would show you around and make you feel like you're just part of it. That's exactly straight away. There's no like, oh, this is the new guy or whatever, and then you have to sort of bed your way in. It was just you like metal. Yep. And you and, I, you and I have both seen him do it. He still does it. Yeah, yeah. He still does it, you know. I see people on the train with a metal shirt and suddenly he he hands is, out, like, he's out stickers. And <laughs> <laughs> good on him. Yeah. Yeah, good on him. Um, what, was, what was the first international show you ever saw? First international show would have been Alice Cooper. Yeah. Here, oh, here in, so I was living in Goulburn. Um, I think it might have been 89. I, le I left Goulburn in 91. So yeah. it was a year or two before that at the old Bruce Stadium at the AIS. Wow, far out. Where I now work. Yeah. So that was, and I had my my first battle jacket was underway and I'd hand drawn a Black Widow on the back, on the of, back the, of it. On the back of the jacket. <laughs> I had no patches, but I had hand drawn a, a Black Widow on the back of my back jacket. Yeah. Um, so 89, I would have been. 17 yeah wow 17 18 okay. um yeah so travel yeah come over here is that a bit, of a, a bit of a game changer a bit of a life changer for you um yeah i pretty much by that stage knew where uh, what i want what i liked yeah, yeah but as far as wow this is a i mean i used to watch all the kerrang videos and you'd watch all these things at you know motorhead at the um what's that english bloody everyone plays at the uh, anyway, oh Hammersmith, the Hammersmith, oh, yeah, yeah, Hammersmith yeah, yeah, Odeon, right? Yeah, yeah. You see this as big crowds and all this sort of thing. Yeah, you get older and you come out of your shell and you realise it's just a shitty little theatre. Oh yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. So to see someone like Alice Cooper and he didn't sell many tickets on that particular tour. Yeah, you're part of this big crowd, but there's not that many people here, and you're up front, and it's like wow, that's like special and unique in itself because it's like. Um, I remember reading that Run to the Hills book, the Iron Maiden one, and um, they were talking about like one of the first tours, that the number of the beasts it might have been, and it's like 84 or 85 or whatever, and they came through and they either played, no, I could be wrong, it's either Wollongong or Wagga. Mm -hmm. it, was just, it was just part of the circuit. Yep. And they played like a tavern, 
tiny place and they had to physically wait for people to finish their meals so they could clear the tables out. And then start and yeah. set up. And it's in the book and it's just, I haven't read it for years, but I remember reading that going, fuck, can you imagine being like a punter yeah. and going, and going it's like, oh, this band from the UK is in town. Yeah, go and check him out. Well, growing up in Goulburn, one of the historic tales from the older metalheads yeah. was Motorhead playing at the Goulburn Workers Club. Wow. Yeah, I think it was late 70s sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and Goulburn's AM only radio station that I grew up with, 2GN, was a couple of, couple of shops down the road, and apparently the tiles were shaken off the building. Wow. But, you know, you, you go, wow, Motorhead played at Goulburn at some point in their career. And that's... Lemmy's like, come through town. Lemmy's come through town. And it's just... <sighs> when I was growing up... It's incredible. I, when I was growing up, I used to... People in bands are untouchable. Yeah. They're like... And it wasn't till Even the Mortal Sin guys, you know, yeah. they were in Met, Hot Metal magazine. I'd go there and I wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't talk to anyone or yeah, anything yeah. like that. I'm now mates with Mick Burke, you know. I'm yeah. now mates with uh, Matt and all that sort of thing. But back in those days, it was just, they're untouchable. I remember, yeah. I remember seeing you guys. Yeah. I was still just coming out of my, that's Lord, and yeah. me, meeting you and meeting Mark and all that sort yeah. of thing. It was just like, wow, now it's sort of, you know. These dicks. <laughs> yeah, well, I remember like, Dave Slave, Sadistic Execution. Yeah. As much as I love Dave, it used to be, wow, I'm talking to Dave. Now it's like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and... It took me yeah. a long time to realise that these people are just actually people. They're just guys. Yeah. They're just guys. And um, coming from Goulburn, that was it was so far away. Yeah. Yeah. It was just we didn't have that. You're man, disconnected from disconnected. It all. Yeah. My intro was blue light discos. Well, okay. my first intro was a mate at school, older brother syndrome. Okay. He loved Priest. He loved Iron Maiden. He loved That's all right. Not a bad influence. So having a bit of a smoke at Chris's brother's place. Yeah. Wow, this. <laughs> This stuff is really cool. That led into sort of more the, the Venoms, the Iron Maidens. I really like the the new wave of British heavy metal. But we had the Blue Light Discos. I don't know if you're old yeah. enough to remember oh, Blue Light well, Discos. I'm not. Oh, I remember them, but I never went to them. So one of the yeah. DJs there had a son my age. Okay. And part of his work would take him to Sydney. Yeah. Once a month. And yeah. so the D Blue Lights were once a month. Yeah. He would come back with some records for his son. And he would go to this shop called Utopia. And okay. this is when it was in Martin Place, downstairs. Oh, right, okay. This is sort okay. of the original... Going back. The original Utopia. <laughs> and so the Blue Light Disco was always four hours. Okay. And there would be 15, 20 of us yep. with our battle jackets on. Yeah. Okay, and you'd, you'd boarded your studs. Or well, mum had gone, to, you bought your studs at Liverpool and you got <laughs> put a few more studs on. We'd hassle the guys in the Motley Crew patches and all this sort of thing. <laughs> but we used to sit on the sides for three hours and yep. 45 minutes of the yep. Blue Light. And then for 15 minutes every night, this guy would get on and DJ. Okay. And he would play just the latest, you know, the latest sort of whatever was happening. Yeah. And 15 guys would pack a scrum around the speaker. The rest of the Blue Light Disco would stop with their arms folded and watch. <laughs> we would have our 15 minutes. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, have been a Metallica fan. Yeah. I remember that's how I first heard Metallica. Yeah. 83. 485 maybe okay and he's played this song and yep. it just went in my mind it just went on and on and on and i've come out of the blue light disco on a high going that was great woke up the next morning i was a bit crook i gave my brother ten dollars i said go to the record store i think they're called the four horsemen i don't really know what it <laughs> and he's come back with this record his yep. lp and he said I couldn't find a band called The Four Horsemen, but this is a band called Metallica. And it's got a song on it. And they've got there. a song on it called The Four Horsemen. I hope this is it. $9.90 or something for the for the vinyl LP. Put it on. I went, that's the song. Wow. And that sort of... And that was, that was it. That like was it. it. Just, just kicked you into it. Kicked me right into it sort of thing. So, I mean, that, the, the tape trading. I know Dave always talks about the tape yeah. trading, but I had so many blank cassettes with stuff that people had given me yeah and yeah they're rough ass i still listen to songs where someone's actually hit the recording button you can hear it and something else has come over like you're on a bus trip with oh, school yeah. <laughs> and that song has got like two five seconds of talking in it yeah. to me that song still has that five <laughs> that's minutes right of, if you hear the actual song you still got that thing at in this particular head. point something's <laughs> going to duck in here that's um, like me like uh i used to have that the dual cassette deck yeah and i would record songs off the radio and I'd be like stopping and starting really quickly to try and stop the 
the announcer saying something mm-hmm. or the next song kicking in. And there's so many songs that even now I listen to it and it gets to a certain point in the song where the radio presenters just thought, you know what, I've had enough of this song. I'm going to shut it off and put another song in and it bleeds over and I've stopped it and you can hear where the song changes and the next one kicks in and I hear them now and I hear those, cha- you hear those changes now. yeah I do well, I've got a lot of um, the old Triple R oh, yeah. from the 90s yeah. when, and they used to do a lot of Ren and Stimpy in between songs oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'll, listen, I'll hear a song now and I expect the Ren and Stimpy little log 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 yeah, log yeah. to come after that particular <laughs> song because that's what I that's that was, the ver- that was the version yeah, that I yeah. always listened to. So, um, yeah, so I don't know what else. Grew up in Goulburn, metal through that sort of thing. Um, then 91, I'd been cooking at a local restaurant. Yep. The Greek, Greek family, he wasn't a chef, I wanted an apprenticeship. Um, wasn't going to get an apprenticeship there. Mm. Mum gave me 400 bucks. She said, I'm not kicking you out of home, but go to Sydney. <laughs> go to Sydney so I went went down to Sydney for one day I had a job interview and a house interview got both ended up in Sydney as an apprentice there you go and you're off started off in Chatswood yeah with a bunch of hippies <laughs> there were six people living in this house I'm t- 1920 and we had a 40 year old jazz musician living in the garage yeah he taught me so much I was playing bass at the time I yeah, okay. had, had a rough old bass yeah and he was on the doll but he was on the dole and he justified it by, I'm a practicing musician. We would go to um, Brackets and Jam. Brackets and Jam down at, um, on the wharf. Okay. It was Monday nights and it was just like people drinking chai tea and pot <laughs> going on. But it was like you book in the week before and you go and have your 15 yep. minutes. Yep. And we were securing jazz singers. Oh. And Claude was a nerd, Claude, but he was a great musician. Yeah. I remember just going to Brackets and Jam with him every Monday night, just seeing people doing their thing. You'd have a jazz singer, you'd have someone on guitar, you'd have just all these different musicians coming up, and he would hassle the best singers. Come and play on my recording, come and play on my recording. But I worked a lot of nights. Yeah. He would write Potter around the house, and he'd knock on my bedroom door, and he'd look at me, what are you doing? Oh, not much. Are you practicing? <laughs> it was practice. It was about, it was practice. about practice. It was about practice. It was yeah. like, if you want to do this, practice. Yeah. You know, but I was working as well, so mm. I did actually play bass in a band in a semi-popular punk band called Downtime. Really, Downtime with Billy Hughes. I didn't realise that. Yeah, yeah. I um, see this this podcasting thing can work yeah. quite well. You, you well, discover a lot of living things in and- living in Newtown. I used to go to Feedback. I don't know if you yeah, remember. Yeah, I, I I never went. I think it was before my time, it but I know of upstairs yeah. above Newtown Railway Station. Oh, really? The load okay. in the load in was a set of stairs like that oh, around the back of the okay. station. I don't even know what's in there now. I think it's there's no, nothing. It's all changed yeah. around there, but I caught on with this. It's downtime. I just loved them. I thought, and I was known as Downtime Man back in the mid '90s. Yeah, go. I travel wherever. I remember seeing them playing at the Sandringham when the Sando had the stage behind the bar yeah, on, mil- okay. on milk crates. Yep, and there were forty kids at the window. Wow. The place was packed, and there were these forty kids, fifty kids who couldn't get inside because they're underage, yeah. just watching just watch Downtime through the window. Wow. Um, you know they did. They toured with Suicidals, they toured with the Dead Kennedys when they reformed. Um, sorry, Sex Pistols, sorry. With Sex wow. Pistols when they did that filthy lucre. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. They yeah. came back, so... Yeah. Um, but a, I didn't realise, I didn't know the history of Sydney Punk. Hmm. I used to wear my downtime shirt. Yeah. And there was... <laughs> I think it was the Courthouse Hotel in Newtown. Yeah. And the singer from um, Toe to Toe. Okay. He's got the birthmark yeah. on his face. Yep. I didn't realise. Billy from Downtime originally formed Toe to Toe with this bloke. Right, okay. They had a big split way back when he went and formed Downtime. I did not know the history. I'm wearing my Downtime shirt. This barman spat on me. Oh, really? And it's just like fucking Downtime, get the fuck out of my pub. And it's like, man, what are you talking about? Wow. This is a country bloke who's like... It's like, it's like uh, over-the-top footy teams or something like it that. It was yeah. really severe. Um, wow. But, yeah, I sort of would watch and watch and I remember being at feedback one night and I overheard Billy talking to the bass player yeah and he's like um mate it's been all good run there's no hard feelings and I'm sort of going he's leaving the band he's leaving the band (laughs) and so I sort of went home and practiced a bit a little four track recorder and I'd plug in I had all the tracks 
and I would practice and I practice and it popped up on on the street downtime looking for a bass player yeah so I went in went out down to Zen yeah where they all yeah and, yeah okay rehearsed for Zen rehearsed for him um, auditioned Billy rang me up two weeks later he said um the drummer is just a bit concerned you're a fan okay. and everyone knows you're a fan yeah you know you, you do really well you play really well but you're a fan yeah we just don't know about that so they um uh, eric growth mm. eric growth was a football he's eric growth senior was a football player okay okay played for Parramatta. right eric growth jr okay playing in some he got the gig oh okay, okay. this is before his football career took off oh so once again I, rem go. I remember going to watch punk, punk and then into footy i remember watching his first gig and I'm standing here with my arms folded going, I wouldn't play it that way, you know, I'd, I'd be running down the fret instead of playing it up here, and, <laughs> you know. But good on him, I still enjoy downtime. Yeah. Six months later, his football career took off. Ah, uh, so he's out, he's gone. I got, mate, guys, I've got to leave. Instead of advertising again, Billy's called me up. He said, mate, I've, you're in. Yeah. So I did three, four years with downtime. We really? never, we, we recorded a few demos. Yeah. Um, I, the drummer left as well so basically downtime became just billy yeah and the drummer we have i've never i'd like to run into him and i don't know if you can help he was a big black fella an islander called yeah. pat okay and he was playing in some metal bands at the time this is sort of early 2000s okay all right um but oh. we played at club 77 i don't know if you remember club Se on 77 williams Street. i know i know oh yeah uh they had down um, from the coke sign they yep because uh destruction played there with dark order and dungeon okay um, that would have been 2002 maybe yeah. there's a little fire pit like uh, it was it was just a fire risk in there it was yeah just tiny oh, little, it was crazy yeah 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 um so that was my first gig there i played with them at the metro oh really yeah. okay yeah. so i only played a few gigs um it was just keeping the name going sort That's of good. unfortunately billy's passed away he's been he, okay. he bike accident about six years ago okay yeah but the local grungies mate they all knew downtime they yeah far out go and look go and look them no up no idea oh, there's, well, a, there's a lot of good live footage out there from feedback and all that sort of thing so and so when when that ended for you was it just a case of like all the the chef work that you were doing was sort of more of a priority at that time or did you continue on it to came, try and no it came to a point of i've got to make a choice yeah okay i'm an all right bass player yeah you know i could chunk out every billy loved me because i i had studied the four albums and the ep i yeah. knew every song billy yeah. goes what do you want to play whatever but i that's what i knew yeah i knew how to play this fast punk stuff yeah technically i wasn't the greatest bass player I was a finger player, yep. um, which spun him out because punk, punk, you know, they're they're, they're, low, they're low strung pick, yep. pick players. I'm a Cliff Burton fan, you know. I, <laughs> I, I learned to play with my fingers. Yeah, but I just got to a point of well, that was fun. I was contracting at the time, so I worked for myself basically. So if I wanted to play, you could, I could play. Turn on, turn off, turn off. Yeah, yeah. And then it just got to a point. Well, that's probably not going to be where I'm going to go. Mm. So mm. I just, I'm more focused on the and just jam with people when i had the chance um that's cool yeah wow so okay so going back to the chef work when did you even think that being a chef was a path that you wanted to follow were, were you interested in cooking where was it 13 was it 14 mate yeah 13 14 easy Cause, yeah cause when you told me and this is a few years ago but you told me you're a chef and i just I mean, I just seen you at gigs. You're just a metal fan, and and, and most people you never know what they do for a day to day job. Mm. You just see each other, and it's got, amazing to yeah, see what people actually do. <laughs> it's, it, it's such a stupid thing when you think about it, but yeah, people actually do things outside of yep. listening to metal. But um, yeah, how did that how did that all start? Um, mum, mum was pretty big on teaching me to cook. She loved, mum loved cooking, and yeah. I did I did home ec at school. I just always thought I'd like doing it. Yeah. And I got a part-time job when I was 14 and a half, 15, at a local restaurant. And I worked there till I was 19. Yeah, right. Um, wow. just, just doing Friday, Saturday nights. Yeah. You know. And what, was, what sort of restaurant was it? It was one of those typical Greek restaurants. You've, yeah. You know, you've got your veal dish, then you've got your chicken dish, all the five sauces, all the oh, five yeah. sauces, <laughs> your spaghetti marinaras, you know. Yeah. It had it had one of those big menus, yeah, you know, yeah. veal six sauces, chicken six sauces. It would have been a trial by fire because 
I was kitchen handing. I started off kitchen handing. Yeah. You know, I was just washing fry pans and washing yeah. plates and, you know, yeah. Goulburn's busiest restaurant, 200 people a night. Yeah. Getting yelled at in Greek and. <laughs> um, Your malaka. Yeah. <laughs> daka, 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 dikanya. Hurry, hurry, <laughs> hurry, fry pans. It was like, what the fuck are you saying, mate? Oh, okay, you want fry pans. All right, yeah. no worries. <laughs> um, I got to year 11. Mm. Another thing you don't know about me, I was a big horse rider. Okay. Mate, I show jumped. My grandfather was an old stockman. Yeah. Um, grew up not really knowing my dad, so he used to take care of us. He used to take us out. Yep. Working at the local abattoir with him, mustering cattle and all that sort of thing. So 1988, I was year 11. Yeah, okay. And I'd been selected, bicentennial year. Yep. Droving Australia. They opened up all the old, old droving trails in the Northern Territory. Okay. Okay, and they chose 300 kids from around Australia between 16 and 18. There yep. were 5,000 applicants. Yep. Um, and they came down, they did, um, I was a scout as well, so I knew about camping, I knew about bushcraft, I knew, I'd grown up on horses. And so they came down, rigorous training, rigorous testing, and I got selected to go to the Northern Territory for right. three months. Three months? Okay, three months yeah. on horseback mustering cattle working on you know there were guys from queensland there were guys from victoria melbourne a couple from new zealand and it was just part of the one of the bicentennial activities going on throw a bunch of young teenagers on was it a bit like a boot camp in a, a bit, way a bit like a boot camp but you know we were just you'd wake up in the morning you'd feed yourself you'd get your horses ready you'd jump on the saddle and you'd ride That's for it. the day wow we got taken aboriginal camps we got taken out on the piss so it was pretty relaxed you know yeah, okay. you're all 16 but <laughs> well yeah out back pubs let's go and have a drink and so but i but that was my year 11 yeah i did really well in year 10 year 11 i was away for three months wow got towards the end of year 11 i said mom this ain't going really well yeah they've offered me a job at the restaurant yeah and mum sort of said look they've introduced these new things called um traineeships okay they go yep. for 12 months yep, yep. Do one of them instead of year 12. You can still work at the restaurant at night. So I did an accounting train, uh, accounting secretarial traineeship. Yeah. Which 20 odd, 30 years down the track, I can still touch type. I know how to work databases, which with my current job yeah, yeah. is very important. Yeah, yeah. So that appeased her. I did that for 12 months, got my little certificate, worked in the restaurant. Then it's like, well, maybe I should get an apprenticeship. You know, manual, the Greek owner, he was just a Greek bloke who cooked, so I yep. couldn't get an apprenticeship with him. Yeah. Moved to Sydney. Wow. Moved to Sydney. And I spent my time cooking, going to see gigs, working at different places. I then ended up at the Sydney Showgrounds. Okay. So I was third yep. in charge at Sydney Showgrounds from about 99 till when I left. Huh. So I saw, I worked 10 Easter shows, I worked 10 big day outs. Big day outs. Big day outs would have been interesting. Big day outs for me were great. Like I said to the guy when he offered me a full time job, I said, "Happy to work everything." Yeah. But I need big day outs off. Yeah. He said, "You'll have to work in the mornings." Okay. All right. Mate, I was letting people in the back so I, I got on so well with security. You always always feed security. Yep. You always yep, feed because when. Right. Mate, I've got five mates out the front. So you get off the railway station, then you'd go that way to get through the gates. Yeah, yeah. These guys would come straight across towards the big dome. Yeah. Little side gate at the side. Yeah. I'd be there. Let open him the in. door, let them in. We had one year there, mate. About 20 other people have gone, Oi, look what's going on. <laughs> and the five of us are just pulling on the gate, trying to close the gate. I said, if these people get in, I'm gone. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, so <laughs> Easter show for me was 14 days straight. Wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, big day outs, just big events. Learned yeah. how to really do big events. Yep. And then um, Canberra happened. Met a young lady, moved to Canberra. Um, fell into the AIS. Been yep. at the AIS now for Australian Institute of Sport for yep. six, six years now. And it's sort of, there's not that many people in Canberra who can do 2,000 people. Yeah, So absolutely. I sort of, I found a niche here. So, so with, with that, what, what does that actually entail? Like what? What? What's it look like? Because you know, you could you could just say, oh well, well we're we're catering, got, but we've got a dining hall yeah. that seats two hundred and sixty people yeah. in one sitting, so we can do five hundred people. Yeah. When I started there, getting onto sports now. But when I started there, we had two hundred and twenty scholarship holding athletes okay. who lived there. Yep. You'd have ten year old gymnasts. Yep. 
up to basketball players. So that was their home. Yeah. And so predominantly we were just doing athletes, doing yeah. athletes. Yeah. After the 2012 Olympics, 2012 Olympics, didn't do too well. Mm. The government changed the whole system. They gave the money to the national sporting organization. So basketball, here's your money, do with it what you will. Yeah. Cycling, do with it what you okay, will. Okay, they split it up. So these guys just start going, well, instead of sending our guys to Canberra, we may as well stay at the Brisbane in, 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 um, Institute of Sport. Mm -hmm. We now have 40 live-in athletes. The AIS has 400 rooms. It's one of the biggest hotels in Canberra. Yeah, 40? Four, yeah, we've got 40 live-in athletes. So now you've got sports versus commercial. Commercial yeah. go, we need to make money. Wow, okay, yeah. So we do a lot of school groups now. Oh, okay. A lot of tour groups. Yep. A lot of arguments going on at the moment, but the athletes, and we do a lot of sports camps. So yep. you have the gymnastics camps for two weeks. There's a yep. hundred gymnasts, they're in for two weeks training. Yep. The Matildas, the Raiders, the Brumbies, oh, yeah. like okay. the ACT league yep. and rugby teams. Um, they all eat there. Um, but quite often the feedback we get now is, particularly the guys who live there, I've trained all day, I've come in for a meal, and you've got 200 fucking 12 year old school kids just <laughs> screaming and running around. Don't need that. Yeah. Um, it's copped a bit of a bashing in the press of late. Mm. Okay. Just because of the way it's gone, it's yep. no longer focused on sport, you know, comments of tumbleweeds blowing down the main road. Yeah, and yeah. So um, there's changes going on out there at the moment. So we do, we do the athletes, we do the dining hall. Yeah. We then also do the events. Yeah, okay. So that's where we're doing our dinners for 800, 900 people. The Raiders end of year dinner, the Brumbies end of, end of yep. year dinner, those yep. black tie yep. formal events. Yep. That's what we do there as well. Yeah, nice. Right, so so what's, what's your role in that? How do you, do you oversee or are you I, a part, part last, of it? Or? Last five years, I'm not much in the kitchen. I'm yep. more, I'm the manager. Yeah. I oversee a team of 30. Yeah. So you go uh, from from operational as far as being yeah. sort of physically involved with it to very, just making sure and that things are very run. physically involved. Chefing takes a lot out of you physically. I mean, yeah. I'm now getting arthritis in my hips. I'm now sort of the is that, back is going. Is that from like a pivot thing? It's a pivot or, thing. It's working on hard floors. Yeah, it's sort okay. of and, oh, yeah, and working absolutely. sixteen hour days. Wow. I used to work so many hours. I still work a lot of hours. Yeah. But I've gained a lot of experience. Yeah. And I think that's what you do. You get to a point when you get to a certain age and you go, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I'm going to find something better. Yeah. I still do a lot on the floor. So you want to have an event. Yeah. Okay. You're doing, a, you've looked at our menu. You've chosen four entrees, four mains, four desserts. You yep. come in yep. and you do a tasting. Okay. And so I will always go out and I'll do the tasting. All oh, right. Okay. okay. So you and your four, four members of the board, and then from that tasting, you're writing your notes and you'll choose your two entrees, your two mains, your two desserts for your dinner. So I'm still involved on the floor, creating the next menu. I'm out there creating the next menu. Yeah. When shit hits the fan, I can still jump on the floor. Yeah. But I've still got, I've got the food safety side of it to take care of. I've got budgets to worry about. My whole mindset has changed now. Yeah. I'm sort of very budget so many to, so many facets that you have to be you're not focused on just one function and that's it you've got a no there's so many different areas that you and have the to be company because it's a contract out there so the company i work for are a sydney-based company mm. and they go for iconic australian venues so we've okay. got we've got center yeah. point tower we've got the opera house um centennial park by um botanic gardens yep um i'm now sort of sort of moving away from the AIS I've become the food safety guy for the company right. so I go to Sydney quite often now and I'm auditing Sydney Opera House so I'm doing an inspection at oh, Centre Point Tower I have no idea there yeah you go. I'm off to Sydney in two weeks time um, another benefit is the AIS have a training camp in Italy because you were just over there I've not just too long ago just come back from Italy working with the Australian rowing team yep so 54 very big eaters and the complaints always been it's Italian caterers okay they don't they're not getting what they get at the AIS and that's nothing that the Italians do wrong but is that the cuisine I guess do you mean like cultural the yeah the type yeah. of food they're getting yeah. the portion sizes they're yeah. getting yeah a lot of cultural differences yeah okay so that was my second trip yeah. I, 2015 I went over for a month to work with the Matildas the female yeah. soccer team Australian wow. soccer team they requested I go over because they'd heard rumours about the food. 
Um, and I have to write reports. I have to report yep. on back to what's going on. And I think the crux of it was, there's an Aussie pride thing as well. Yeah. If you're an Italian and you're feeding Australian anything, who cares? Man. Whereas Slop me, I was like, man, I'm feeding the Australian rowing team. And these, make sure it's, these boys have got to yeah. go to the world finals, world championships when they leave here. And I've got to make sure that they're on, they're out training every day. I've got to make sure they're nutritionally ready to roll as well. Is there a bit of science behind it? There is a lot of science behind it. Yeah. Um, I work closely with a nutritionist now. Yeah. So, you know, once again, every menu we write, we have to provide the recipes. Yeah. The recipes go through a bit of software. They get analyzed. Wow. We cut back a bit of fat here. We increase the carbs there. Um, nothing we put out isn't analyzed. Yeah, wow. So It's pretty, pretty technical. It is very technical. Wow. So I've taken that cooking and I've now sort of another complete side of it. The company that I work for have just secured the contract for the ARU, the Australian Rugby Union, yep. the, the Wallabies and the Sevens. They're building a new facility at Moore Park. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's going to be a training centre for yep. the... I got an email last week. We need you at a meeting in St. Leonard's at three o'clock in two weeks' time because they, when they put the tender application in, they use the AIS as a template. Okay. This is what we. This, this is what is our. Sta- this is standard. This is what our company already does. Yeah. We're going to bring the bloke who does it. So, yeah, it's pretty good. It's very good, mate. It's very good. I have a suggestion. Yeah. I know you still got a little bit of a uh, beer. I, think I can sort that out. <laughs> do you want to just take a quick break yep. and then we'll do a part two? Because right. I think uh, we're about half hour in. I reckon we can get another half hour out. Of this. Yeah, we'll see how we go. Yeah, sounds no good. Worries. All right, cool. We're right. back. Don't know if I've got much else to go. No, nah, you got heaps. That's, that's pretty much me. Trust in a me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm just trying to think of where we where we uh, left off. So. Um, Cooking, nutrition, Australian athletes. Yep, so getting quite technical. Yep. So you've moved away a lot from just sort of the kitchen, well, the kitchen hand back in Goulburn. Yeah, yeah. To, to being quite, I mean, you must be a bit of an influence now as far as, you know, people coming to you to get your expertise and experience to... It's, it's nice, and I think I think people get into that when they they spend any career, any, put you put effort into it, Kylie is a is a nurse. Yeah. Now she's been nursing all her life. Yeah. She's now moving into management roles and right. director yeah, yeah. of nursing, assistant director of nursing type roles. Yeah. Okay. And we're both at this stage where it's like we've both worked our asses off. We've done the hard yards. It's nice to get into a position where you're using that expertise, that knowledge, and you don't have to slog it like you used to. No. You've done, well, you've done you've done the hard yards in that sense. The I mean, you still got a hard work, but on a physical sense, yeah. you're right. Yeah. On a physical sense, you're right. I mean, when we do the events, I am there. I'm on I'm on I'm on the floor. I sort of, um, and I'll still do my day shift. So I'll yeah. start at six thirty, and I'll do my day shift, and then we'll be on do the event till eleven o'clock that night. Oh. You know, sort of, but. You know, it's it's not every day. It's not every week. Mm. It's sort of we do events probably every two events a month. Okay. So I don't work weekends now. I'm Monday to Friday. Once it's again, nice change. One, it is beautiful change. I spent so many years doing those Friday Saturday nights and because hospitality would have been so like hospitality for me. I'd never. I would never ever consider working in hospitality. Uh, but I know, know a lot of people that do. I missed a lot of gigs because of it yeah you know that, and that's just part and parcel of it yeah, but yeah. i used to catch up with a lot of people at two in the morning <laughs> which could be an advantage actually because yeah. you're not you're like they're they're well on their way they're well on their way but you've got you you've got the advantage that you've only now to start drinking and it's you know two o'clock in the morning or whatever and you can you can last and, the night and i think that's where people get the perception of chefs being drunk so i mean i used to get there and i'd hit it hard yeah you'd get there at 11 12 one o'clock in the morning Everyone's been on it. Yeah, let's catch up a little. Let's catch, catch up. up. <laughs> you know, it's sort of. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it was hard. Those Friday, Saturday nights in particular, where you're at the restaurant and everyone's out doing whatever they're doing. Um, but, you know, in hindsight, I'm glad I did it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, from a hospitality point of view, I mean, you're in the kitchen nine times out of ten. 
Yep. Were, you, are you, were you out in the floor at all? No, I hate front of house. I yeah. hate customers. I yeah. don't. I, <laughs> um, no, it's 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 a particular sort of person that. Yeah. That's a different skill set. Yeah. That's a different skill set. You know. Yeah. Even the interactions with waiters and waitresses, you'll hear that whole front of house, back of house, yep. not yep. getting on. Yeah. It's quite often a perception. Where I've always loved the industry. A la, a la carte restaurants. Yeah, okay. Okay. Something goes wrong. You can't file. I've always said you can't file it away. Come back tomorrow and sort it out. You You're in a situation where it. there's a paying customer there. You've burnt their steak. Something hasn't been cooked properly. You've forgotten whatever's happened. You've got to figure it out there and then. That's it. You've got, you to got sort a choice. It out. Yeah. Yes. Now, yes. you know, quite often yes. the perception is that chefs are aggro or chefs are a bit. Man. I mean, I've had waitresses cry. They'll come in and they'll ask you a question. Yeah. And you all got five things going on. It's more the blunt responses. Yeah. It's a yes or no answer and you go back to what you're doing. Yeah. He was mean. He was nasty. It was like, you've come in and asked me, can I have this without prawns? <laughs> okay. Now you've given me an option to give a yes or no answer. Yeah. Okay. No, it comes with prawns. That's the way it is. We're busy. Rah, rah, rah. Well... The customer wants it that way. And I said, well, mate, just put an order in with no prawns. I'll see the docket and I'll make it. Yeah. But you've given me an opportunity to give a yes, no answer. <laughs> you want to stand there and argue about it? Put the order in, we'll make it. It's that waste of time, isn't it? It's that waste of time. And because you are watching your time so much, so quite often your answers are very short and abrupt. They're not mean. You're not being nasty. It's just... You've asked me a question. I've given you answer. Move. Yeah. I've moved on. Yeah. So that's where a lot of that comes from as well, sort of thing. It's just communication. Communication of... Yep. I've got two seconds to give you an answer. I've given you the answer. Yeah. Um, Do you think um, with... Because a big fad over the last few years has been around cooking. Um, you know, if you're looking at reality shows, and it seems to be a big, big fascination with it. And you know, the Master Chef stuff, and uh, whatever the other one is, the cooking no, kitchen I, I don't and actually shit. Watch, I don't actually watch. <laughs> no, it. good on you. But that has um, has it spurred a lot of interest, I, and people will come. It spurred interest in. I think people have a lot of expectations now about yeah, okay. what, what they're going to get. Yeah, interesting. But, okay. but it's yeah. affecting the industry. It's really affecting the industry. And, and I think it's, mate, don't get me started. It's kids in general. I think we all know the <laughs> argument of... These young whippersnappers. They expect a lot straight away. Yeah, okay. Now, yeah. I, yeah, 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 absolutely. Entitlement. I did three years before an apprenticeship. I then did four years in an apprenticeship. Yep. And then a couple of years after that, before I really started, was expecting good money and all yep. that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. An apprenticeship now, you can actually choose to do components. You don't have to do the butchery cut component if you don't want to. Okay. You can fast track. 18 months, you can be first year complete. Okay, wow. Yeah. And it's all about, a lot less about going to college now and in-house training. Yeah. So I just get, I've, I've had two apprentices at the AIS. We get the documents. The trainer comes and sees me every, are they com com competent in that? Yeah, I saw him do it the other day, you know. The reliance is now back on us to spend more time with them. Make sure they're caught. Make but sure they're experienced. And I went to college yeah. one day a week. It was a full day, and you were you had a bloke who was focusing just on you to make sure you were doing everything properly. Me, I might spend half an hour, an hour with the apprentice a week yeah. if I get the chance. Yeah. But I'm expected to sign off on his competency. And then they don't have to do the fish segment. They don't have to do the butchery segment. We had to do it all. Mm. So a lot of fast track. I'm a chef. I expect $60,000 a year. And it's like, well, good luck to you, mate. You know, <laughs> go and have a look in the papers. It's sort yeah, of, yeah. and they don't want to work weekends. Um, so it's, it has changed. And the, uh, there's a big influx of international Okay. You know, the, the big yeah. debate about we have too many international people yeah. coming to Australia. Yeah. I'm not going to get into that, but the reality is there aren't enough kids putting their hands up saying I'm prepared to do it. Well, I know there's a, there's a good example of uh, someone that I know from years ago, still very good friends with, and he was working at a naval base where there's a lot of... Uh, I could get this wrong, but uh, the welders in the big boilers. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they put the word out and could not find any local local people that were interested, and so they had to get them in from Korea, yeah. South Korea, and. 
pay these guys good money and and they did a good job absolutely they did a good and, job and there for a long time as well and it's just a case of and yeah we won't we won't dive into this because it can be a rabbit hole it that's be, exactly can, right <laughs> i don't know but it's it, it's a case of if people are willing to do it then that's great if they're not willing to do it then there will be other people that will dive in yeah and they might not necessarily be from around the corner but it is what it is it and, is what it is yeah. and, and there's a lot of arguments i mean that whole Kids, mate. I can't get into this stuff. <laughs> but um, you know what I mean. I've got my opinions, and yeah, we are yeah. raising. They're so focused on this. There's no communication. There's no sort of from a digital point of view. Digital yeah, point yeah. of view. They're losing touch with the languages. Deteriorating. Yeah. It's sort of. You know. Yeah. Yep. Um, the, ri- the written everything. communication has deteriorated in written. some ways, but I'll, I'll give you some. I'll give you a, a glass half full perspective. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, I think, and I've spoken to a few other people. I spoke to a gentleman just before we we, mm-hmm. we caught up and say everyone listens to the podcast. It was Adam, but um, I think, I think the the, the access to, to knowledge through technology has never been better. So it's if you're great. searching for it. Yeah. then you can find it but it's that whole gap between do i want to search for it or do i just want to cop whatever's shoved in front of me that's right mate. and and i think i think there's a lot of younger people that are getting thrown into and i don't like the word but that entrepreneur side of things i think there's a lot of younger people that are starting to get into that so it's a flavor of the month at the moment but it's that whole independent self-employed do your own business hustle a bit and all that and i think that can be quite good and having technology and if kids can learn how to navigate technology and now with websites and coding and programming and all that sort of stuff then that's great see i think that's that's a big issue as well i mean i i know kids and i used to pull things apart I, i remember the old TV, pull it apart, put yep. it back together, okay. coat hangers linked together to create an aerial to watch ABC in black and white. You're smarter than me. I just but pulled them apart and then went, oh, that's cool. That's and right. <laughs> How do I put it back together? <laughs> but I think a lot of that's gone as well. It's like, this does this. Mm. If the router, goes, I if the router goes down at home, I would expect my kids to be jumping all over it. Yeah. But, but they, the knowledge, they'll yell out and say... The knowledge isn't yeah. there. And I, I yeah. love technology. Don't get me wrong. I love technology. I think it's great. But I can just see its negative sides as well. Yeah. And I can really see that we're, sapping we're away. We're too of, reliant on what we too have. Too reliant, exactly. And we and, take it for granted as and, well. And not knowing how it works in the back end. Yeah. Not knowing... So if it all fell apart... Oh, we'd be, we'd be fucked. You, we'd be, you wouldn't be able to tinker around yourself and cobble <laughs> something together and make it work, you know? This, um, um, I think it's, it might be, uh, it might be Joe Rogan. He had a stand up thing years and years ago, and he, he, he spoke about if a meteor hit the world, somewhere in the world, and it just wiped out electricity, and we all went back to like the cave age, and, and we, had, we had nothing. We had no electricity, nothing. He goes, Does anyone know how to build a mobile phone? Mm. Does it, anyone know how to how to put that together? Does anyone understand the technology behind it? No. No, that's yeah. right. It's yeah, we would be going back to how the fuck do we understand how to start a fire, and then suddenly we're back to that primitive age, and, and, and those we would, basics have even been lost. Oh you know? yeah, it's yeah. sort of like metallurgy. Um, it's all factory based now. Yeah, it's all yeah. sort of from. Yeah to go out in the wilderness and start a fire or to like you say it's those simple things are being lost i mean I've, lost it, yeah. I, I've heard you know there's all a lot of theories about why we don't go to the moon anymore i sort of believe we, we got told not to come back but that's that's another thing is like we went there yeah. we got told don't come back yeah yeah okay. okay yeah that's fine but i've read that we have actually lost the technology we've actually lost the know-how of how to do it yeah it's sort of i mean the computers they were using to get man on the moon the first time was in my is in my back pocket at the moment you know what i mean easy yeah so that whole skill set of getting us up there i once again i personally believe it was a sort of what are you guys doing here get the fuck away don't you come back we're doing things up here (laughs) but um, But it's like um we are reliant on technology but i think this is a 
especially being here in Canberra, there's so many, you've got so many universities and there's a lot of young people and I've, you know, even for this weekend, trying to work out who to talk to and I'm going through the, like on Twitter, like the hashtag Canberra and I'm looking at all these like tech kids that are getting into technology. There's a percentage, don't there, get me there wrong. Is. Don't it's, get me it's wrong. It's not the majority because no. the majority are reliant on what we have. Yeah. And I think there will be eventually a backlash. So you'll have the technology giants and the guys who, who will support the world. They'll support the world through apps and, uh, and you know, services and, and even like to, to order a drink and, and whatever. Like you will have to sit, you can sit back and everything will be catered yep. for you. Yep. But I think there'll be another, there'll be a backlash in the sense of, and I see it every, every once in a while, especially when you look at uh, cafes and restaurants and you look at that rustic, old school organic mm -hmm. appeal and the whole vegan vegetarian the hippie sort of thing that backlash where everyone wants that organic grassroots not just from a cuisine point of view but just that feeling that atmosphere so i think even from a handmade perspective i think that side will come back and it people needs. will like blacksmithing woodwork and all that kind yep. of thing i think that will come back and i think it'll come back strong because people will reject well and you're starting to backlash. see it in music as well i mean and unfortunately you know vinyl is making a research yeah, yeah. which is pushing the price of vinyl up which <laughs> the people who buy vinyl are suddenly <laughs> going it. and have always yeah. bought vinyl. it's like <laughs> fuck it was it was looking good there for a while yeah, yeah. i mean that's another thing once again not many kids actually have a collection anymore. Yeah. They have a collection on a, on a device, device yeah. which is probably stored in the cloud. It's yeah. not actually a locally stored yeah. file. It's yeah. sort of something that I can press play and it's yeah. it plays. If it all falls down, it's gone. What have they got? They don't know. What, that's that's what bothers me. It's like if it all yeah, I di I've digitized everything I have. Yeah. Here's a discussion. Here's a question for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I bought a vinyl album okay. 25 years ago. Yep. Okay. Said vinyl album is now still available on CD for $25. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I have downloaded said album. Yep. Put it on my computer. Yep. It's now free for me. I, I love networking. So yeah. I can, I've told on my computer, I can play it on the telly, I can play it on the laptop, yep. I can yep. play it out yep. the backyard. I've heard different arguments about this. Is there an issue with the fact that you, I you refuse? I'm it. not paying it. I'm not paying yeah. for this because I bought it for nine dollars back when you released it. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Honestly, I don't. I think if I don't download anything, I don't have. Yeah, like I've been through my vinyl. I could go out and I could buy one of them USB turntables and I could I could convert everything to a data file. Yeah, but it still sounds it sounds shit. And yeah. I think and I think. Like my dad's going through that at the moment. He's got like all these old records that he's had, and they're in very varying yep. conditions of play. Like some of them he's played more than others, and he he's bought all this equipment and he's, he's converting it to MP3s on his computer. He loves it. He, it's fantastic. He's like, oh, this is amazing technology. But I listen to these MP3s. And I go, that sounds like shit. That's right. Like, <laughs> all the way through the scratching noise and. I just, th I, I honestly think, even if you didn't own that album, I don't think there's a problem. And and that's really controversial because yeah. I think there's a lot of bands out there that you need to support them and you need to pay, like they, they spend a lot of time and a lot of hours producing music. We do it. And I don't necessarily say that that music should be allowed to be acquired for free, but I just, to move with the times you've got to move with the times but you've got to I, I appreciate the fact that you've got to not so necessarily generated income you've at least got to pay what cover what you've outlaid yeah it's true it's true and if, i think if, if everyone was to turn around andy if everyone if you put out your next album yeah and you had no sales yeah oh it suck you know what i mean you had yeah. no sales yeah. and everyone had you're watching your on different formats getting streamed here getting downloaded there it would be annoying uh, so it, i it would i mean i've got no problem i you know buy a lord album yeah. i'd love to buy the vinyl yeah and give me the download code 
Yeah. So every, then I've yeah. got a digital copy of it for my modern devices. That's right. I've got my vinyl that I love. You're covering both. I'm both covering parts. both bases, yeah. sort of thing. It's um, it's a, it's a slip, slippery slope because we always look at it as it's 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 hard and it will change. And this is the the thing about music at the moment is that over the last probably ten years, but the last five years especially music's changed so much mm. and the way we listen to it the way we acquire it the way we collect it and sometimes not collect it it's just everything's changed and i honestly believe that if you make music you produce music you release music you should be monetized for it you should be paid for it whatever that is I, I is up for agree. dispute yep but i think so for us we do cd cds still we have downloads so you can download it we also have streaming as well. One of your best, sorry, I'll cut in. One yeah. of your best things is that USB wallet thing. Yeah, yeah. Mate, the card. It's been to Europe with me twice. Fantastic. And it's something you can jam in the oh, car. I've seen a photo. You can jam it into the car's <laughs> USB, mate. It was like yeah. that to me. I still love looking at that big vinyl yeah. picture. Yeah. Yeah. But that to me, convenience. I've bought it. Yeah. You guys got some money. I've got a lot of data on a. On just a tiny little card. A tiny little card. Yeah. Problem with that is um, potential for losing it. Yes, that's right. It's something that doesn't fit into your CD rack. It's something that doesn't, it floats around in baskets or it's sort of, <laughs> you know, oh, they're already, I've got to make sure I put that in a cupboard somewhere. Then yeah. six months later, where the fuck did well, I put that? For me, like for years, I collected, I, co I was a music collector, vinyl, <laughs> CDs, cassettes, yep. everything. And I had everything in shelves, neatly alphabetical order and a fantastic display and so when i got something that didn't quite fit it really annoyed me like this ocd point of view yeah, i'm like oh I'm how's same, it fit in my cd I'm rack the or, same and um but now like I, I sort of look at it from another angle and just think if people can access it yeah then then i think that's great but the other thing is like when you're purchasing music i think everyone should purchase music in one way or the other but i think if you're if you're able to obtain it for free then it's, it's a marketing angle so I think if people are willing to download your music for free, legally, then I still think that's pretty amazing because someone's making the effort to actually acquire your music. However, what what is smart by the band is to be able to have a number of other things in place to be able to catch those people. I was going to say, do you see that that downloading for free as a possibility for that punter to walk through the door at the next gig? So, yep, so through touring and also through merchandise. Yep. So someone goes, well, I acquired the music, but I want a T-shirt. Yep, yep. And so we've we've toyed with this, this concept where you release music, but it's music only acquired through... Purchase, purchasing a... Through a T-shirt. Yep. So it's like buy a T-shirt and you get the music. The music's almost an afterthought, which is which sounds so ridiculous. But you have to sort of look at it in a way that it's all turned on its head. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, so it's like the Metallica pop-up store. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> there we go. Here's, here's being relevant. I fucking love that. Yeah, I yeah. love it. The, the fact that so that the just for anybody listening. We're, um, I just forgot, but we're even recording this. We're just having a chew yeah. wake. But um, Metallica's doing these stadium tours. Like, I, I can't believe, I can and I can't, I can't believe that a band like Metallica, <laughs> after all these years, are playing bigger places than they've ever played before. There was like, I'm pretty sure there's a, a comment from like Kirk Hammett who said, like this is like playing stadiums with Guns N' Roses on the Black Album tour. Only Guns N' Roses isn't isn't here. Yeah, yeah. Like they can do it on their own and they're packing them. And so what's happening at the moment is they have these pop up stores, these merchandise stores. It's like okay, we're going to play in Atlanta next uh, tomorrow or next weekend. So we're going to put up a pop up store. It's going to have all our merch in there, and people can go in there for three days, with specific times. We'll advertise it everywhere. People come in, buy tickets, uh, buy uh, buy merch. Merchandise, sorry. yeah. But they also go in the running for different things, like I think being the snake pit yeah, and all the these sign, sort of things. Sign yeah, memorabilia. and um, and then people gravitate towards it, and then there's all this additional hype, which I said online, not that they need it, no, but, but they come to town, they play, they destroy. And everyone loves it. They've already got merch, and then they buy. And I saw uh, a guy I know 
who commented on the thing that I posted on Facebook about it. And he's like, I was really disappointed with it because they didn't have any tour merchandise. Like, he didn't have a specific, like, a this shirt, is the shirt with the date. And I thought, you know what? That's so smart because you buy your general yep. apparel from there and then you go to the sh- the go the go to the go to the go you go, go to the, the show up. yep and you physically buy the tour shirt there that's right. so so you're not only buying merch there you buy merch at you're the buying show. your skateboard at the oh, shop before you go right. and buy your bloody yeah. t-shirt it's, i love it i love it yeah but um i mean metallic is an exception to the rule and and they can get away with a hell of a lot more than a lot of other bands but it goes back to that concept of you have to think outside the box yeah uh, your bottle openers your little things yeah. that yeah you know and people will buy them yeah people will buy them and obviously i'm sure there's not much of a markup on what you guys nah. and i say you guys i mean bands in general yeah i see merchandising i was like you must have spent a lot of money to get this you know i sort of yeah i steal assassins mate first thing i do Day one, get there on Friday afternoon, I hit the merch table, I grab that, 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 spend my money, go to the car, put it in the car, <laughs> and I'm done. Yeah. It's sort of, yep. I've, I've made my outlay, I've done my bit, and I love it. It's, it's where you get to, I put the sticker on my beer fridge, I sort of, I've got the bottle opener hanging with my other bottle, and I look at them and I remember that band, so I'll go and listen to that track again. Yeah, sure. They're little triggers that sort of... So, from a punter point of view, when you buy that stuff, are you buying it because you want to support the band or do you identify with the band? What's the, what's the reasoning there's, behind there's it? Because obviously the music, the music's a different thing. There's you, support. Yeah. It's, I, I, I acknowledge the modern age we live in. Yeah. And me purchasing that is putting a little bit more money in their pocket. Yeah. Yeah. And I've always been about, you know, I don't, I can't do much, but I will support how I can. Yeah. Free accommodation. Yeah. Um, Thank you, by the way. Purchasing a t-shirt. <laughs> um, my little videos I do for Dave for Steel Assassins. They're yeah. just little things that cost me nothing, but I know it's going to have an effect for it the helps. person at the other end sort of yeah. thing. Um, yeah. And I think that's what it's all about. You want to see these guys next year put something out. You want to see them next year. You want to see them the year after. It's sort of... Um, you want them to stick around. You want them to stick around. Yeah. And that, there's a greed element there as well. You know, so, and I think OCD as well. I'm, bloody local Canberra band, Hellbringer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've they released, um, just re-released their last CD that was a year and a half, two years old, on a limited edition, another, another vinyl. Yeah. I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna buy it. It's definitely gonna get played. <laughs> but you it's got to go in the collection. It's gonna, there's continuity. Yeah, and continuity's yeah. a big thing for me as yeah. well. And I was the same with my collection. I alphabetical. Yeah. Chronological. Yeah, absolutely. It was yeah. just sort of. Yeah. Whereas I have a mate in Goulburn, Griffo. Now Griffo is a bit of a. When I was growing up, Griffo was. He was the metalhead. Yeah. Okay. You know, he was a couple of years older than me. And Griffo used to have the Blacktown Boys. And the okay. Blacktown Boys had come to Goulburn and they would destroy Goulburn. They'd yeah. be in the paper. Yeah. And they'd come for a weekend, they'd go. Yeah. I went to Griffo's oh, a couple of months ago now and his CD collection is haphazard. Yeah, okay. He's like, I don't care what I put my hand. And I said, mate, I'm looking for J or I'm looking for K. He said, no, you just put your hand on something, you grab it out. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate that mentality. Yeah. It's just like, it doesn't have to be rigid. It doesn't yeah, have yeah, to be sort of, yeah. I like what I've got. Yeah. It's just, just dive in and grab dive something. Dive in and grab something. Because you know of. that whatever you're going to grab is something you love. Yep. Yeah. It's a little like, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very similar to you. I, I would buy every album in a band's collection, even if there were shit ones, because I had the finish or I had to complete yeah. the collection. So even that album that was in the mid nineties was a bit oh, yeah, where are they right, going? Yeah, yeah. yeah, a bit influenced or threatened by the grunge grunge era mm-hmm. or whatever. I'd buy that For because that continuity. It, it fits in, absolutely. Yep. And now, like and I've I've gone through and sold a bunch of stuff that I don't I never liked. I never liked or never played because I just wanted to fit in the, the rack so it sat there and looked nice. And I get rid of it and I go, you know what, now I can do a similar thing to what Griffo is doing. I can just put my hand in yep. and I can grab something, grab something and I know that no matter what I pull out, You're it's going to like it. go, fucking oath. Yep. Let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. Uh, I can see that. I can see the benefits of that. 
Boy, it's like he's getting cold now. I was eh? going to say. <laughs> I think let's uh, let's wrap this up. We'll finish his beers. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, mate. It's been Appreciate a pleasure. It. It's really nice to see you, Andy. Absolutely. Really nice. All right. Cool. Cool. Take care. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. If you want to reach out to Mark, I'm going to have all of his details on the show notes over at andysocial.net. As with all of my previous guests on the Andy Social podcast, lots of lots of cool people there. So make sure you go and check out all of the previous episodes and have a listen and make sure you reach out to people that you find interesting and want to connect further with. Before I wrap this up, thank you very much, as always, for listening to the podcast. You can rate, subscribe on iTunes. If you listen to it on another podcast platform, if there's any way to like it or comment on something, leave some feedback, please do so and let me know as well, because I'll definitely make a mention on this podcast. And uh, YouTube links, liking them, commenting, sharing them around, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know where I haunt. Make sure you get on there and do the little social media love things and uh and I'll be extremely grateful. And guys, if you make the effort for me and leave me some fantastic reviews, make sure you plug your stuff. Let me know what you're doing, what you're up to, what sort of products you have, what sort of band you're in, what business you have, what you do for a living, or just tell me how awesome you are and I'll make sure I plug you on the podcast in future. But enough of me. Thank you so much again for dedicating your time listening to my fantastic podcast and I'll be back next week. Thanks guys. Bye-bye.